this is Rosa Shaw, and I'm here to guide you through the daily activities, events, and the ins and outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one of the some popcorn box, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. Hello, Rosa Shaw here with another episode of A Word from the Metaverse, and we're going to talk about disrupting Twitter. More importantly, can any social media app have the same broadcast capacity to just to broadcast a message globally in the instantaneous and wide-reaching fashion that Twitter has become. Right now, uh, Twitter is the go-to place for news and information, various uh, subjects and topics. If something happens in the world, you're going to likely find it uh, broadcast first on Twitter by users that are in the area or someone who's their witness to a particular uh, subject matter. The biggest thing is uh, when it comes to like natural disaster relief, getting information out to people whenever a election result occurs or a terrorist attack, like for instance what happened in Manchester with the bombing at um, Henri Grande. Uh, the news first hits Twitter before it's picked up by either news outlets or television or anybody else or Facebook Live. Uh, Twitter is the place to go. Twitter is the place to go for social activism. Twitter is the place to go if you want uh, your, either your local, state, providence, or national leaders uh, speak to their constituents, their people on Twitter. The current U.S. president is the biggest example for the best of the worst of it, uh, broadcasting his thoughts on Twitter. Can a social media app be able to have that same level connection with people globally and yet give people the kind of protection and privacy protect both privacy protection, individual protection, and protection from harassment that people seek that has been a bit of a flaw with Twitter, as long with protection from um, their metadata being um, mined, if you will, from various corporations and ad base or even Twitter itself. So before we go and talk about some era parents that are seeking to do that, and some are seeking to do something a little bit different than it. So something I found, I personally I find very fascinating, and I think is going to be, and is increasingly becoming a very strong game changer when it comes to, to individuals having the ability to uh, create their own. And that is a 3D printer. It's come a long way uh, from just kind of globs of plastic to where you're having food being 3D printed to re- really fine pieces of metal is being printed with the 3D printer. And now we have this. A vector successfully launches its microsatellite with a 3D printer part. Most More tests are on the horizon by Angela Chin. This is from The Verge. Vector is a microsatellite company started by a founding member of SpaceX and successfully launches vehicle which has a 3D printer part in California. This is the first of several Several launches for the for the company, which focuses on small satellites that weigh only a few dozen pounds, and unlike SpaceX larger probes, it was called the Vector R. It has received over one million dollars to work on a vehicle launch today, called the Vector R. We also wanted to build micro rockets, but Elon has other ideas. Jim Cantel, Jim Cartel, Vector's CEO and SpaceX first vice president of business development, told The Verge last year he was interested in building a company with large rockets for the Martin uh, ecosystem. We're more attracted to the smaller stuff. Vector R uses a special 3D printer injector that the company tested last December. The injector is part of it that delivers propellants to power an engine. Instead of building multiple parts and then assembling them as typical, the Vector R uses 3D printed technology to build everything in one piece, which is supposed to drive down costs and make the parts fit together better. Vector will soon conduct another flight test in Georgia. So this is another step of a way of how 3D printing is going to do really disrupt the manufacturing and allow for more individual control of just pretty much everything. Leak, the UK secret blueprint with telcos for mass spying on the internet phones and backdoors despite the register a full-time full-blown snooping with breakable encryption uh, this came out earlier this month is by Kieran uh, McCarthy the UK government has secretly drawn up more details on this new bulk surveillance powers awarding itself the ability to monitor Brits like communication and insert encryption backdoors by the backdoor it's the draft technically ca- technical capability notice pa- paper all communication companies including phone networks and ISPs will be obliged to to provide real-time access to full content of any named individuals within one working day, as well as any secondary data related to that person. That includes encrypted content, which means that the UK organization will not be allowed to include true end-to-end encryption of their users' data, but will be legally required to introduce a backdoor to their system so authorities can read any and all communication. In addition to comms, providers will be required to make bulk surveillance possible by including systems who can provide real-time interception of one in 10,000 of its customers. Or other words, the UK government will be able to simultaneously spy on 6,500 folks in flight at any given moment. 
and according to the draft, telcos and other telecom platforms must provide and maintain the, capa- the capability to disclose where practicable the content and communications or secondary data in an intelligible form and remove electronic protections applied by or on behalf of the telecommunication operator to the communication or data. The live surveillance of individuals require authorization from secretaries of state overseen by a judge appointed by the prime minister, and there are a few safeguards built into the system following strong opposition to early drafts of the Investigatory Powers Act. Closed doors. What will concern many, however, is how the draft paper and its contents are being handled. The technically capability notice paper has only been provided to a few selected companies, mostly ISPs and telecos, in a short four-week consultation, but a copy of the draft found its way to the Open Rights Group, which popped it online today. And according to the document, it's already passed through the UK's Technical Advisory Board, which composed six, compromises six telco representatives, currently O2, BT, BT, B, Skype, B, Cable, and Wireless, Vodafone, and Virgin Media, plus six people from the government's intercepting agencies and broad chairman. That means that the contents have already been largely agreed to by most of the organizations that have been included in the closed consultation. Consultation. It's unclear whether the Home Office intends to make it available for public comment after the time or whether it will seek to push it through the legislative before any outside the consultation group has an opportunity to review it. The rules will have to be formally approved by both House and Parliament before becoming law. You ain't seen me, right? The process and approach seems to be purposely obscure. The rules come under Section 2673. I of the Investigatory Powers Act, a group, a one paragraph section that refers back to section 253, which covers technical ca- capability notice. There's no mention of the technical capability notice paper existing either on the House office or the, the Home office website or on the Gov UK consul- consulta- cons- consultation website. And the only reason we know about it is presumably because someone at one of the few companies that had been sent the draft rules decided to tell Open Rights Group about it. But what the nine-page document does is provide the government with the legal authority to monitor any one in the UK in real time, as well as effectively make strong and unbreakable encryption illegal. The act of stripping away safeguards on people's private data is also fantastic news for hackers, criminals, and anyone else who wants to snoop on Brits. The seals are finally coming off. This lays bare the extreme mass surveillance the conservative government is planning after the election, Liberal Democrat President Saul Britton told us his statement is a full frontal assault on civil liberties and people's privacy. The security services need to be able to keep people safe, but these disproportionate powers are straight out of an Orwellian nightmare and have no place in a democratic society. The Home Office private consultation is open until May 19th, and if you'd like the UK government to know your views, then email the investigatory powers at homeoffice.gs.gov.uk. So that's already passed, but it's still ongoing. Uh, the UK is going through a snap election, and now that the, there has been another terrorist attack, I would imagine, just like the states did when they passed the uh, Patriot Act, I think that this act in itself was going to pass. I have one more news story, but I just want to make a comment. Not the next episode, but the episode afterwards. I'm going to talk about ransomware and WannaCry. The WannaCrypt uh, ransomware that has been disrupting the internet, or at least portions of the internet thus far. And I, lot, I know a lot have been talked about it, but I, I kind of want to get in the heart about ransomware and what exactly it is. Its origin story, as well as the usage of cryptocurrency as a, as a component, but not an exclusive key component of ransomware plus the the whole uh hoarding of zero days and not informing uh, various telecommunication companies isp providers uh, hardware software companies about certain exploits that the governments have been utilizing and not informing them that hey there is this flaw in your in your product if you will this is from ted crunch google's alpha go ai wins three match series against the world's best go player by john russell google's apple go has once again made the case that machines are now smarter than man when it comes to game strategy, at least. Apple Go made its name last year when it defeated high-profile Go player uh, Lisa Dahl 4-1, but now has beaten the world's best player of Go, the hugely complex ancient strategy game. Today, it won against Go's world champion, Ki G to pledge a second decisive win of a three-part series that's taking place in China this week. The 19-year-old Qi Ji nearly lost the first time, but th- th- this time AlphaGo forced his Chinese opponent in- into conceding. That's despite Qi Ji playing perfectly at the beginning of the tie, according to AlphaGo's analysis. I'm putting my hand on my chest because I thought I had a chance. I thought I was very close to winning the match in the middle of the game. But that might not have been what AlphaGo was thinking. I was very excited. I could feel my heart thumping, he said in a post 
Kai press conference. There's still another game to be played, but irrespective of the result, AlphaGo has defeated the man universally acknowledged to be the best player in the man's most complicated strategy game. The another mind stone to chalk up, even though there's been plenty of controversy because the live stream can't be viewed in China. AlphaGo was created by a London-based deep mind, which was acquired by Google for around $500 million in 2014. Beyond winning showcase matches with the world's top Go players, DeepMind believes his tech- technology has practical and everyday use that can solve intelligence and make the world a better place. Things have gone, haven't gone gone to pan out that way just yet. Instead, DeepMind has been mired by controversy. A data-sharing partnership with the UK's National Health Service initially heralded as having potential to optimize uh, medical care to reduce the number of Preventable deaths ran into issues when it was recently judged to have no lawful basis. Critics have seized on the data transfer of 1.6 million patients' medical records to the Google-owned company as part of the project. The original agreement remains under investigation by the UK's data protection watchdog, the ICO. So AIs are stepping up their game. There's there's a lot of stuff that's coming out of the AI movement, particularly with the whole uh, black box where you can't really see there are like these boxes where the AIs are kind of developing their own language program and thought process, and you can't really see it until it outputs that information. But you know, um, you know, you have chatbots, you have all sorts of data mining, crunching programs that are out there, and it's just a matter of time before something really coalesces, puts forth a really unique and game-changing information sharing or information output that is going to really um, kind of rock the world if you think about it. But this is one of many first steps, if you will, of AI coming into prominence um, into the, the world space, if you will. So that is it for the news. On to the subject at hand, disrupting Twitter. Leaked the UK secret blueprint with telcos for mass spying on the internet, phones, and backdoors to spy the register. A full-time, full-blown snooping with breakable encryption. Uh, this came out earlier this month is by Kieran uh, McCarthy. The UK government has secretly drawn up more details on its new bulk surveillance powers, awarding itself the ability to monitor Brits' blood communication and assert encryption backdoors by the back door. It's a draft technically ca- technical capability notice pa- paper. All communication companies, including phone networks and ISPs, will be obliged to provide real-time access to full content of any named individuals within one working day, as well as any secondary data related to that person. That includes encrypted content, which means that the UK organization will not be allowed to include true end to end encryption of their users' data, but will be legally required to introduce a backdoor to their system so authorities can read any and all communication. In addition to comms, providers will be required to make bulk surveillance possible by including systems that can provide real time interception of one in 10,000 of its customers. Or, other words, the UK government will be able to simultaneously spy on 6,500 6, 6, folks in blight at any given moment. And according to the draft, telcos and other com platforms must provide and maintain the, capa- the capability to disclose where practical the content of communications or secondary data in an intelligible form and remove electronic protections applied by or on behalf of the telecommunication operator to the communication or data. The live surveillance of individuals will require authorization from secretaries of state overseen by a judge appointed by the prime minister, and there are a few safeguards built into the system following strong opposition to early drafts of the Investigatory Powers Act. Closed doors. What will concern many, however, is how the draft paper and its contents are being handled. The technically capability notice paper has has only been provided to a few selected companies, mostly ISPs and telecos, in a short four-week consultation, but a copy of the draft found its way to the Open Rights Group, which popped it online today. And according to the document, it's already passed through the UK's Technical Advisory Board, which composed six compromises, six Telco representatives currently O2, BT, BT, B, Skype, B, Cable, and Wireless, Vodafone, and Virgin Media, plus six people from the government's intercepting agencies and broad chairman. That means that the contents have already been largely agreed to by most of the organizations that have been included in the closed consultation. Mm-hmm. Consultation. It's unclear whether the Home Office intends to make it available for public comment after the time or whether it will seek to push it through the legislative before any outside the, the consultation group has an opportunity to review it. The rules will have to be formally approved by both House and Parliament before becoming law. You ain't seen me, right? The process and approach seems to be purposely obscure. The rules come under Section 2673I of the Investigatory Powers Act, a group in one paragraph section that refers back to Section 253, which covers technical capability notice. There is no mention of the technical capability notice paper existing either on the House office 
are the the Home Office website or on the Gov UK consul consulta consultation website. And the only reason we know about it is presumably because someone at one of the few companies that had been sent the draft rules decided to tell Open Rights Group about it. But what the nine-page document does is provide the government with the legal authority to monitor any one in the UK in real time, as well as effectively make strong and unbreakable encryption illegal. The act of stripping away safeguards on people's private data is also fantastic news for hackers, criminals, and anyone else who wants to snoop on Brits. The seals are finally coming off. This lays bare the extreme mass surveillance the conservative government is planning after the election Liberal Democrat President Saul Britton told us in statement is a full frontal assault on civil liberties and people's privacy. The security services need to be able to keep people safe, but these disciplined Disproportionate powers are straight out of an Orwellian nightmare and have no place in a democratic society. The Home Office private consultation is open until May 19th, and if you'd like the UK government to know your views, then email the investigatory powers at homeoffice.gs.gov.uk. So that's already passed, but it's still ongoing. Uh, the UK is going through a snap election, and now that the, there has been another terrorist attack, I would imagine, just like the states did when they passed the uh, Patriot Act, I think that this act in itself is going to pass. I have one more news story, but I just want to make a comment. Not the next episode, but the episode afterwards. I'm going to talk about ransomware and WannaCry. The WannaCrypt uh, ransomware that has been disrupting the internet, or at least portions of the internet thus far. And a lot, I know a lot has been talked about it, but I, I kind of want to get in the heart about ransomware and what exactly it is. Its origin story, as well as the usage of cryptocurrency as a, as a component, but not an exclusive key component of ransomware plus the the whole uh hoarding of zero days and not informing uh, various telecommunication companies isp providers uh, hardware software companies about certain exploits that the governments have been utilizing and not informing them that hey there is this flaw in your in your product if you will this is from ted crunch google's alpha go ai wins three match series against the world's best go player by john russell google's apple go has once again made the case that machines are now smarter than man when it comes to game strategy, at least. AppleGo made its name last year when it defeated high-profile Go player uh, Lisa Dahl 4-1, but now has beaten the world's best player of Go, the hugely complex ancient strategy game. Today it won against Go's world champion, Ki G to clinch a second decisive win of a three-part series that's taking place in China this week. The 19-year-old Qi Ji nearly lost the first time, but, the, but this time AlphaGo forced his Chinese opponent in, into conceding. That's despite Qi Ji playing perfectly at the beginning of the tie, according to AlphaGo's analysis. I'm putting my hand on my chest because I thought I had a chance. I thought I was very close to winning the match in the middle of the game. But that might not have been what AlphaGo was thinking. I was very excited. I could feel my heart thumping, he said in a post Thai press conference. There's still another game to be played, but irrespective of the result, AlphaGo has defeated the man universally acknowledged to be the best player in the man's most complicated strategy game. The another milestone to chalk up, even though there's been plenty of controversy because the live stream can't be viewed in China. AlphaGo was created by a London-based Deep Mind, which was acquired by Google for around $500 million in 2014. Beyond winning showcase matches with the world's top Go players, Deep Mind believes its tech technology has practical and everyday use that can solve intelligence and make the world a better place. Things have gone, haven't gone to pan out that way just yet. Instead, Deep Mind has been mired by controversy. A data-sharing partnership with the UK's National Health Service initially heralded as having potential to optimize uh, medical care to reduce the number of Preventable deaths ran into issues when it was recently judged to have no lawful basis. Critics have seized on the data transfer of 1.6 million patients' medical records to the Google-owned company as part of the project. The original agreement remains under investigation by the UK's data protection watchdog, the ICO. So AIs are stepping up their game. There's there's a lot of stuff that's coming out of the AI movement, particularly with the whole uh, black box where you can't really see they're going to take these boxes where the AIs are kind of developing their own language program and thought process, and you can't really see it until it outputs that information. But, you know, um, you know, you have chatbots, you have all sorts of data mining, crunching programs that are out there, and it's just a matter of time before something really coalesces, puts forth a really unique and game-changing information sharing or information output that is going to really um, kind of rock the world if you think about it. But this is one of many first steps, if you will, of AI coming into prominence um, into the, the world space, if you will. So that is it for the news. On to the subject at hand, disrupting Twitter. So let's talk about Twitter for a moment. This 
get into its history. In particular, let's talk about its importance in its history. So this comes from last year from The Wired. Uh, it's by Julia Greenberg, and the title is On His 10th Birthday, A Short History of Twitter and Tweets. So Twitter turns 10 today, which occurred March 21st. As it enters an awkward pre-teen years, the company that invented fame in 140 characters had a tough run recently. It lost its longtime CEO, Dick uh, Costello, who was replaced by co-founder and formerly ousted CEO turned new CEO slash saver, Jack Dorsey. Yes, people use Twitter, more than 300 million of them, and yes, Twitter brings in money, more than 500 million each quarter, but its stock plummeted to an all-time low this year as Wall Street worried over its slow, slowing user growth. People rightfully complain that the platform can be a hotbed for hostility. It also offers a loudspeaker for the disenfranchised, but swarms of voices also silence through announcement. Its company, its platform, and its world's biggest cocktail party, I mean, sometimes it's a mess. And so... Right there, just in that paragraph, you can kind of, it summarizes the importance of Twitter. It is that loudspeaker. It allows for all these different voices to be able to speak. Um, it allows a swarm of voices. It, it has a place in the zygest, if you will, of the world. But it has its problems. And those problems is the harassment. Um, there's a lack of protection when it comes to certain uh, groups, if you will. The fake accounts, the, the bots, uh, <clears throat> these are issues, if you will. But all this problem with Twitter is everywhere. In a place where the world take, talks to itself, often sharing, even making news in the process, Twitter has become a powerful force, but, was, but it wasn't always that way. It began with a tweet from Jack Dorsey himself, whose uh, Twitter handle is Jack. Just setting up my Twitter, TWTTR, which was uh, he tweeted uh, March 21st. The name Twitter comes from a uh, NOAA class in the Oxford English, a short, inconsistent, in Consequential burst of information chirps from birds. Hashtag Twitter, which is TWTTR. The San Francisco crew that birthed Twitter as a spinoff of podcasting company starts chiming in. And then it kind of goes on with other people. As in the hashtag. So Chris Messi, how do you feel about using uh, the hashtag pound for groups? As in hashtag bar camp. And then he italicized message. And this was August 23rd. Uh, 2007. In late 2008, co-founder Even Willing takes over as CEO. In 2009, news starts breaking on Twitter, most famously when Captain Chelsea Sully Sullenberg made a successful emergency landing in the Hudson River. So Janice Kearns, and he had a he had to actually embed uh, his tweet. It wasn't um, embedded. It was like a link to his picture. There's a plane in the Hudson. I'm on the ferry going to pick up people. Crazy. So that was January 15th. That is a um, little over three years, almost three years after Twitter started. That same year, the first major Twitter celebrity passes 1 million followers, and that was Ashton Kutcher. Uh, that occurred April 2009. The next day, Oprah joins. Uh, Hi, Twitter. Thank you for a warm welcome for the early 21st century. Then the first tweet posted from Space Arrives, Mike Massey. Uh, by 2010, the Library of Congress had determined that Twitter is important enough to deserve pr- prosperity. The next year, Twitter plays a central role in Arab Spring Revolution. Um, you have anonymous, everything is fine, love the Egypt government, and has a blackout box. It's also one of the first places where signs appear that something was about to go down in Abad Arab, Pakistan. Spoiler, Osama bin Laden was killed. Uh, so you had a tweet occurring that, that very day, helicopters hovering around Abad at 1 a.m. is a rare event. And that was May 1st, 2011. It became an organizing tool for Occupy Wall Street. Can we get 20,000 people to barricade Wall Street until their demand for real democracy is met? And that's from Adbusters. Hey, celebrity used Twitter to rent airlines too. By 2012, Twitter was getting weird. And welcome to social media, Pope Benedict. In 2013, Twitter launches Vine, the minutely shareable six-second video clips that have spawned the careers of a few of a new kind of celebrity. The ad industry collects heads explode over the seeming potential real-time adver- advertising tied to major events such as the power Going on to the Super Bowl, uh, I think it's 37. You can still dunk in the dark, Oreo cookies. Weird Twitter stare is weird. If your grade doesn't say rest in peace, and if you are automatically drafted into the skeleton war. Also in 2013, Twitter became a publicly traded company. So 2006, Victor C starts, it starts having to have to answer to shareholders. It's like seven years. Uh, Ellen tweets the most really tweet of all time in 2014. Um, that's not the case. I believe the... Was a Wendy Nugget guy surpassed him? 
uh, sports take over Twitter at the 2014 World Cup in Brazil because it becomes the site's biggest sport event to date. Uh, Twitter Shorts becomes a forum. Uh, this is where you see people put like one slash and then address their different issues. Twitter acquires and launches live video service Periscope, um, which is now embedded into it. It used to be separate, but now is, is part of Twitter. Uh, Clayton Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner becomes the fastest Twitter account to reach 1 million users. Uh, Jack is back, and POTUS finally tweets. Uh, he started tweeting in 2015. It turns out people really like faves and really don't like likes. So Mike Durka, I guess he's Twitter headquarters, we're losing the social media war. What do we do? I need ideas. If you change stars to hearts, brilliant. And don't forget election 2016 Twitter. So thanks, Twitter, but really you don't have to distract from my creative process. So these are just a highlight of some of the different things. Uh, I wish they had a little bit more social aspects in there. You know, Black Lives Matter, Occupy Wall Street, they did mention that. Uh, Anonymous, WikiLeaks, uh, the Arab Spring, uh, what's going on in Venezuela, Brazil. There's been a, a series, uh, even in Iran, uh, what was going on in Iran at the time, at different points of time, um, their election process. Uh, Twitter has been there. It's been in a mechanism for people to organize. And it's because of this, from the very silly to the very serious, this broadcast ability that Twitter has, that it has an importance to it. So I'm going to read some highlights of another um, <clears throat> article that addresses the history of Twitter. Uh, and then we'll go, we'll talk about some of its problems and then people seeking to disrupt it. So this is from socialnonics.net. Uh, by Mark Johnson, it was published in 2013, so it's a little bit ways back. So, right here, Twitter spreads the news. Uh, Twitter is much more than your friends telling you about their day. It has changed the media politics of business. Many will report they, they hear their news first on Twitter. Stories of natural disasters, sports scores, the death of a celebrity, and more are shared first on Twitter. Social media and microblogging site Twitter has changed political communication profoundly. In the past, political news and commentary were only reported by a select group of those quote unquote in the know. Today we, but today we see both politicians and the average show on Twitter sharing the political banter and opinions. It's a new era of citizen journalism and we see people speaking up and speaking about the things that are important to them. Twitter has also had an impact on the business of brands of finding a new way to reach their fans where they're already in social media on their smartphones. Twitter has become a tool that businesses large and small can use to reach the target market, provide customer service, share their unique content and more. It's also become a way for everyday people to keep in touch with their favorite celebrities and a tool for celebrities to stay in contact with their fans. Uh, this brings us as, us to some of the most popular Twitter accounts, and he kind of goes through there, uh, which, which is kind of old because it's four years ago. So let's kind of break this down a little bit. Yes, Twitter is one of the first places I personally check, and a lot of people check for news. Uh, moments, which was something that was created by Twitter to kind of curate uh, all the kind of different news stories that are going on. But even still, depending on who you follow, you can get all sorts of different types of news. In particular, news is not exactly covered uh, by the mainstream media. Uh, I think the, the thing that comes to mind is, you know, the Arab Spring, what was going on in Tunisia, and then spread to Egypt. Uh, it wasn't exactly followed or covered until people were tweeting about it and organizing it. And quite frankly, it wasn't until the clashes with the government against the protesters in both Tunisia and in Egypt that you actually started seeing uh, serious um, media coverage. There might have been a few articles there from within the region, but the, the typical mainstream media, that the mechanism that we're all somewhat familiar with, was not there. Same thing is occurring down in Venezuela right now. You have to literally go onto Twitter and social media uh, apps in order to find information. You're not quite seeing it on the daily on CNN or NBC or any of those other uh, Fox News or whatever. Uh, you see occasional story once a week, but they're still protesting down in Venezuela. But if you were to go to mainstream media sites, newspapers, or journalists, you wouldn't know that. You would have to go to uh, Twitter to find that information. Uh, what else? Um, going down here into political commentary. Uh, currently, you know, right now the U.S. Uh, president is notoriously known for being on Twitter and tweeting both on his POTUS account as well as his uh, username account, his regular account, if you will, before he became POTUS. You see that having ripple effects from affecting uh, stock market prices from companies to foreign relations to uh, people having serious questions about certain investigations that are going on. And he's not the only one. There's other politicians that make comments and eras and tweets 
their constituents or other people, you know, retweet it, screenshot it, and ask them to break down their comment, like, why did you have this particular viewpoint? And so you've got to get an insight into a way of a certain influence, if you will, onto the political spectrum. This really heavily um, affects, I think, in my opinion, businesses. When businesses don't have a strong um, social media presence or a strong person has an understanding of like Twitter, uh, Snapchat, or social media and makes mistakes, uh, their users call them on it rather quickly. And there's been a lot of snafus on Twitter from various uh, ads, tweets, uh, likes, favors, things of that nature that if someone is not paying attention, you can seriously hurt your brand. At the same time, there's uh, great successes. For one, um, the Wendy's tweet where a young man tweeted Wendy saying, you know, how many retweets do I need to get to get uh, free nuggets for a lifetime? And Wendy's responded back with a, um, like, 4 million, like a really ridiculous number. And then he starts tweeting and trying to get people to like and like and like. And eventually he he gets it. doesn't get quite to the number that uh, was asked by Wendy's to get that lifetime chicken nuggets, but he did uh, get... uh, more than um, Ellen. It was like the most retweeted tweet at the um, currently right now on Twitter. And so he got like a year supply of chicken nuggets. And that's a boon for Whitney to kind of give some goodwill, a chuckle, if you will, and it puts her name out there in a way that no advertising dollar could have done so. People from years on end are going to remember that. They're going to remember that tweet and they're going to remember that person and what Whitney's did. So it doesn't have that kind of goodwill, nostalgia feeling, especially considering probably the demographic of the, the person, the guy was like, you know, a teenager or something like that. So it probably hit very well with the, the, the younger people, like the teenagers and college kids just tweeting, tweeting and having fun with it and making a comment that as they get older, they're going to have a bit of a nostalgic feel, if you will, or they're going to have a positive viewpoint of Wendy's just simply for that successful uh, tweet, if you will, a successful bit of marketing. So with great power comes great responsibility. And this is where Twitter kind of gets, kind of, uh, you might say, fails. It, it's not been very successful in, tre- in treating its platform very well. It's done some changes to its mechanics that a number of people didn't like. We kind of discussed that a little bit on the review of Hiroja's op about Mastodon, the new uh, social micro uh, blogging site that's seeking to kind of disrupt Twitter, and we'll talk about it when we talk about the parent heirs, the ones that are trying to change or be um be like twitter but different i didn't say that twitter has but giving it allowing the user to have a uh, stronger control they will and we'll get to that when we talk about it but let's talk about twitter as um its problems if you will so let's let's start with some of the problems with twitter so during the past this article comes from the washington post and um, well, this is about the positive thing. I also want to, it kind of ties into the issues that Twitter has. So, uh, during the past decade, Twitter rendered the pound sign obsolete and made the hashtag part of our vernacular. The hashtag uses range from sarcasm and trolling to awareness of social change causes. The latter use, usage has been instrumental in the transition of movements from online to real world. In honor of Twitter's 10th birthday, there are 10, the 10 most influential hashtags around social causes ranked by the number of times they've been used since their inception. All numbers have been provided by Twitter. So 10, hashtag Giving Tuesday. In an attempt to counteract the rampant consumerism that blankets the holiday season starting with Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, and Cyber Monday, but certainly not ending there, uh, 92Y and the UN Foundation gave life to Giving Tuesday. The social initiative, which began in 2012, and whose hashtag still has amassed 31 million uses, as the charities use Give Tuesday in their call-ups for donations on the first Tuesday in December. Uh, the first Giving Tuesday generated 10.1 million in donations. Number nine, yes, all women. In response to Elliot Rogers' misogyny fuel killing rampage at the University of California in Santa Barbara and the hashtag not all men defense that followed, yes, all women aim to give women a place to share their experiences with rape, abuse, sex- sexism, and judgment. The hashtag has was used uh, three million seven hundred times to help share seven hundred thousand times to help share the compelling and heartbreaking stories of women all over the world. Eight, pray for Japan. Pray for Japan originated after the eight point nine magnitude earthquake and tsunami to hit Japan in March two thousand eleven, 
and killing new, nearly 2,000 people. The hashtag, which has been used 4 million times, resurfaced in November 2015 after a smaller earthquake triggered false reports of independent tsunami. Even Justin Bieber tweeted alongside hashtag pray for Paris. So, <clears throat> so you have hash, hashtag Giving Tuesday, which is a charitable effort and shows the broadcast power of Twitter. And then you have this counter thing that goes on within Twitter in itself where you have the marginalized voices now having the ability to speak and broadcast their, their stories, hashtag yes all women, to counter, which was a very uh, problematic hashtag not all men in the sense that not everyone when criticizing Elliot Rogers and the, and the mannerisms and the, the misogyny that he is doing and say that all men do these things, but a great many of them do. And so you get this very defensiveness that happens a lot of times in these social causes. And this is where some of the harassment gets fueled. Hashtag pray for Japan, a very big, huge hashtag. And it, Facebook also has this issue and a little bit of Instagram, but mostly Facebook and Twitter uh, when it comes to broadcasting information where how certain countries and certain uh, incidents get broadcast more so than other countries and things of that nature. Like there's been earthquakes in other countries that are pretty devastating like, like Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, or when there's a an attack, how there's not a check-in for certain countries or certain places when certain events happen, uh, which is what Facebook does. Like, you can check in to let people know that uh, you're good or you're, there's nothing that's happened to you. That, that Those signals don't go up uh, for them as it does for primarily Western uh, or First World nations. Uh, also, social causes like changing, um, uh, what does Facebook have? It's not a filter, but there's like a little picture thing that you can put on your, I guess it is a filter. Uh, those type of filter causes are not as uh, prevalent or pervasive when it comes to other parts of the world. It's beyond the, the Western world, if you will, beyond the first world. Um, continuing on. So someone that does, that they break it does not come from the Western world in, or the first world. Is bring back our girls. Bring back our girls hashtag miraculously managed to become a device at once. Despite its goal of uniting users around the demand for the safe return of the Nigerian school girls, kidnapped by Milan and Islamic group. Although critics were quick to point out the laziness of the use of the hashtag activism, some of the 6 million users of uh, Bring Back Our Girls defended the trending topic, offering their own criticisms of those who shame others for not meeting their standard of awareness. Um, so you have that happen quite a lot where you, people are like, oh, you're just hashtagging and sharing, you're not doing anything. Uh, and studies have demonstrated since kind of the advent of activism and, and Twitter that that is not the case, where the giving goes up, volunteerism goes up. Uh, people are far more active than in the real world than they are just simply online. And these girls are, many of these girls are still missing. and A lot of them have uh, since been recovered and other girls have been taken since this hashtag was created. Uh, Ice Bucket Challenge. I participated in this. Uh, use uh, 600... 6,200,000 users of the Ice Bucket Challenge on Twitter helped make this awareness campaign so incredible popular that folks were looking for ways to avoid it entirely. In the summer of 2014, you couldn't log on to Twitter and even Facebook or Instagram without seeing a friend or colleague being doused with cold water in the name of atomorphic lateral sclerosis or ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease and, ho and hoping you wouldn't call the pod to complete the challenge next. Despite the copious citizens that the challenge inspired, the ALS Association raised millions thanks to the campaign, and a major breakthrough study came out of the, of the funding to, for medical research because of this particular um, hashtag. Hashtag Sandy, again, another uh, national disaster, uh, not national, but nature disaster, if you will. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast, wrecking havoc throughout the Northeast. Hashtag Sandy Carnival, the perils of those affected and the damage done in states such as New York and New Jersey. But nearly four years later, a new study suggests the hashtag was good for more than spreading awareness. According to the study published earlier this month in the journal Science Advance, the 7 million uh, plus use of Sandy, hashtag Sandy on Twitter and other relevant location tag tweets help researchers find a strong relationship between proximity to Sandy's path and hurricane-related social media activity. The findings allows the researchers to suggest the activity on social platforms such as Twitter can be used to rapidly assess damage and aid in the disaster response. Hashtag Indie uh, Ref, the Scottish uh, Independence Referendum, or uh, hashtag Indie uh, Ref, for short, monopolized much of Twitter conversation on the evening of September 18, 2014. 
But Twitter users weren't just following the indie uh, ref to learn the results of the historic vote about Scotland's leaving the United Kingdom. The hashtag was also used 8 million 500 times and was a clear indicator of how political engagement and debate are occurring more frequently online. Number three, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Those were eager to criticize hashtag activism, the, rate, the internet races you uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter used 12 million times. The hashtag is quite, li quite literally transformed an online community on a unifier to a political movement and a tangible organization. Hashtag love wins. After the Supreme Court historic ruling on the same-sex marriage, Twitter included a rainbow heart emoji with each of the 12 million plus mentions of love uh, wins. Hashtag love wins. The monumental decision led other social networks to create ways to let users comfortably show their support, such as Snapchat, custom rainbow location-based filters, and Facebook's rainbow profile picture filter. And number one. Hashtag Ferguson. It should come to as little surprise that the number one that the uh, hashtag Ferguson cruised to number one, more than doubling the usage of the second most popular social issue hashtag. Since its first use, hashtag Ferguson has been tweeted uh, twenty seven million two hundred thousand times and has been amplified in the voices of the community that theater would not be heard. Unrest in Ferguson, Missouri hit Americans' Twitter timelines before the story seized cable news attention. Social media became a critical opponent of the balanced coverage of protests in Ferguson. That is a good point. Like, there with uh, Ferguson, uh, Black Lives Matter, and Love Wins are like these very social and indie rough social causes and political causes that bring awareness. Uh, and coupled that with what is known about uh, Hurricane Sandy, how you can track and build and show uh, a movement not only forming and engaging, but where people are engaging and how they're engaging. And, uh, and learn from that and grow from that and build organizations or build political movements or help with the disaster relief. So this is like a key component of the power of Twitter is broadcastability of connecting and being um, a bit unfettered, if you will, in disclosing or informing or engaging people in a global or even a localized uh, fashion with these type of uh, hashtags. But with it, as we've notice several of these different type of hashtag comes these problems associated with it. This car article comes from BuzzFeed News. It's by Charlie Warzol. Um, and again, it's around the 10-year anniversary of Twitter. So the title of the article is A Honey Pot for Assholes Inside Twitter's 10-Year Failure to Stop Harassment. For nearly its entire existence, Twitter has not just tolerated abuse and hate speech. It's virtually been optimized to accommodate it. With public black backlash at an all-time high and growth stagnating, what is the what is the platform that declared itself the free speech wing of the free speech party to do? BuzzFeed News talks to people who've been trying to figure that this out for a decade. I'm not going to read all this, but I'm going to read uh, different chunks from this particular article. So on May uh, 22, 2008, Ar Ar Ariel Waldman ran out of options. Waldman, then a community manager and blogger, had signed up for Twitter in March 2007, and in months has become one of the platform's 100 most followed accounts. She was, by her own account, addicted to the service. But soon after the, after the abuse began, for no other reason that Waldman was a woman writing articles that occasionally touch on sex and technology. In June 2007, a stalker posted some of her private information in a string of frightening tweets. Waldman contacted Twitter, which banned the user in question from the public timeline. But over the next eight months, the target abuse and stalking intensified. By March 2008, exhausted and delusioned by a torrent of tweets calling her a cunt and a whore and publicizing personal information like her email address, Walden reached out to Twitter again, this time to the company CEO, Jack Dorsey. And after a series of phone calls to the company went nowhere, Dorsey and Twitter went silent. So in May, Walden went public, detailing her deal in a blog post which caught fire in the media circles. Twitter, then a startup, was fresh off a buzzy South by Southwest debut, and Walden's post was an unfamiliar bit of bad press, depicting Dorsey in particular as an unsympathetic, even cowardly chief executive. Jack explained that they're, they're scared to ban someone else, someone because they're scared if they turn into a lawsuit, they, would be, they are too small of a company to handle it, Walden wrote. While Twitter, Twitter's founder, Bizstone, issued a formal acknowledgement of the problem, arguing that Twitter's communication utility is not a mediator of content, Dorsey was silent. Co-founder Eve Williams, who was more critical, posted tweets that cast doubt on Walden's claims and half-heartedly apologized with a simple or bad. Walden was crushed. Prior to my coming out, I had a great relationship with them and considered them some of them my friends, Walden told this. Mm -hmm. BuzzFeed News that month, the fallout. I took it very personally and it sucked. More than eight years after Waldman's ordeal, harassment on Twitter is rampant, so much so that it's become a primary destination of trolls and hate groups. 
So much so that his CEO declared, we suck at dealing with abuse and trolls on the platform. We suck at it for years. So much so that numerous high-profile users have quit the service, cited as an unsafe space. Today, Twitter is well-known hunting ground for women and people of color who are targeted by neo-Nazis, racists, misogynists, and trolls, often just for showing up. Just this summer, actor Leslie Jones was driven off of Twitter after a barrage of racist comments and death threats, only to return after a personal re uh, reassurance from Dorsey himself. Last week, Normie Cordy of the pop group Fifth Harmony also stepped away from the service after suffering years of horrific and racially charged tweets. Despite its integral role in popular culture and social justice initiatives from the Arab Spring through Black Lives Matter, Twitter is as infamous as today as for being toxic as it's famous for being revolutionary. And unless you're a celebrity, or as it turns out, the president of the United States, good luck getting help. So this is, you know, again, this is one of the biggest issues is uh, the abuse and the the ability of Twitter to respond to the abuse that happens to people to, for their protection and their, their lack of cooperation. And quite, quite frankly, if you're not famous or a world leader, you're not really getting, even to this day in 2017, any type of help from Twitter as a company. Even with all the different things that they've done, it really has not been enough. And there are stuff that they can do. They can prevent you know, those bots from being... Um, on their platform, they can do some IP checks, they can do phone number checks. There are things that they can do to ban and prevent the pervasiveness, but they, they, they don't do that because they think they need all these users or whatever to sell themselves, but they haven't been successful in selling and even making money really because of the toxicity. There are certain ads, people that won't come onto um, Twitter because they're afraid of being associated with Twitter in some sense. Kind of skipping around here. Um, kind of give the mindset here. So Twitter's reputation as a powerful broadcast tool was solidified just weeks later. The company hired uh, Margaret Way from Google as its first general counsel. Here you have a great influential lawyer whose philosophical belief that you don't shut down a platform because of controversial speech. One former employee who worked during um, McAvoy's turn told BuzzFeed News. The ethos was brought into by everyone at the company hard. 2000 2011 brought the Arab Spring and more international acclaim for Twitter as a platform for revolutionaries. That same year, Twitter fought secret government order to provide user information for WikiLeaks, and according to source, uh, McAvoy and Stone spent months working on a blog post that would be published during the WikiLeaks controversy titled Twitter, The Tweet Must Flow. It was Twitter's boldest commitment to free speech to date. There are tweets that we do remove, such as illegal tweets and spam, the post read. However, we're making efforts to keep those these uh, exemptions narrow so they may serve to provide a broader and more important role. We strive not to remove tweets on the basis of their content. Not long after Twitter's executives began publicly touting that Twitter, Twitter is a free speech wing for the Free Speech Party, a phrase source attributed to Machiavelli. So the maximalist, support, the maximalist approach to free speech was integral to the Twitter's rise, but quickly created the conditions for abuse. Unlike Facebook and Instagram, which have always banned content and has never positioned themselves as platforms for free speech, Twitter has made it ideologically out of protecting its most objectionable users. The ethos has made it a beacon for the Internet's most futuralic personalities who take particular delight in abusing those who use Twitter for their jobs. This spring, the Just Not Sports podcast posted a video of sports fans reading a sampling of the hateful tweets that the sports writers Sarah Spann and Julia Deco received while writing and reporting. The video amassed 3.5 million views on YouTube, and its message the level of depravity is a commonplace on Twitter. And there's been other similar types of videos that have been like that. Um, I know that Jimmy Kimmel, I believe it is, does a, a mean tweets where he has different celebrities read the mean tweets that people have uh, tweeted them as a joke. But there's some pretty nasty stuff that gets you know tweeted about, if you will. Uh here we go. What once was lauded, lauded as a virtue, virtue has now become the company's Achilles heel. It's the axis around with all the shit with harassment rotates, a former senior employee told, employee told BuzzFeed News. Nearly all former employees BuzzFeed News spoke to in the course of the reporting of the story said the same thing. The whole fee speech ring of the free speech party thing, that's not a slogan. They're deeply, deeply embedded in the DNA of the company. Twitter's former head of news, Vivian Schiller, said that people that run Twitter are not stupid. They understand that its toxicity could kill them. But how do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? I would actually challenge anyone to identify a perfect solution. But it feels to a certain extent that that is led to a paralysis. A senior engineer who left the company before its 2013 IPO echoed Schiller's point. You have this opposition between defending the user's experience and not shutting down speech, all while there's this big, toxic mass of people that are abusing, the source said. The tension is now, I think, in the past few years, flipped on its head and it's clear that something needs to be done. 
So looking back at Twitter's early years, multiple former senior employees cited, cite Twitter's disproportionately white male leadership, leadership, a frequent factual critique of Silicon Valley's biggest and most influential tech companies, as creating an environment where building tools to combat harassment was a secondary concern. The original sin is a homogenous leadership, one former, former senior employee told uh, BuzzFeed News. This is a part of what exacerbates abuse for sure, because they were often tone deaf to the concerns of users in the outside world, meaning women and people of color. Talking enough in Twitter insiders, one thing becomes painfully evident. The company's understanding of its platform hasn't always been clear to employees, even at the senior level. The problem is made difficult to understand after police harassment. One source recalls that when asked, uh, Jack Dorsey refused to answer exactly what kind of tool Twitter was. He said, Twitter is bringing you closer. The former recalled, I said, to what? And he replied, our users always finish that sentence for us. And to me, I thought, well, it's going to be really difficult to set policy in place if we can't define what this thing is. Then I'm going to read this last bit about the, this article here. Uh, internally, employees have long raised questions about whether Twitter was a media company, a broadcast platform that should be governed by content standards and practices similar to a television network or a piece of Internet infrastructure like an ISP that should remain open and free. So this confusing nature because of the, the different things they've done to Twitter, like adding video, uh, broadcasting like television programs, being a source for news, uh, being this broadcaster where people can tweet and express themselves freely around the world has caught in the fact that the company itself and its founder are not capable of defining it, if you will, has um, it has caused this... I don't know the best way to explain it. This weird identity crisis within Twitter. I mean, everyone uses it. It's a, or a lot of people use it. It's quite frequently used. And you, whether you like it or not, even if you yourself don't personally use Twitter, it's you see tweets embedded in news pro, in news uh, articles. It's utilized in news programs. It's, it's something that um, you know politics people, famous people. When that's how you get your news. That's how you get information. Is from Twitter. Uh, more so than Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, any of these other types of services. It's it's Twitter. Twitter is first. Twitter is the leader, if you will. And it's because of this and because of this free speech stance and this confusion identity and, the, and this very hardened free speech stance where they don't have these filters or tools put in place for everyone to combat um, abuse and not recognizing abuse that there, this vulnerability is allowed for people to come for Twitter to say we can do what Twitter is doing and do it better. So I also have other links of very interesting articles about the problems of Twitter um, uh, in the show notes uh, to read at your leisure. One very fascinating one is from The Verge where a Twitter employee learns about the social network's uh, harassment problem firsthand, um, <laughs> which is very interesting. So you have these problems. You have you know the harassment problem you have these like bots that are on there on there either spamming or uh, fixing. Uh, we haven't even discussed the whole uh, political issue where manipulation is going on and data mining associated with Twitter, uh, which is an issue and a problem for a lot of people. Uh, but you have that factor in. And then you have this platform that is so powerful. It is the go-to place for all different forms of information, yet people aren't satisfied with it because of these issues, these flaws, people are seeking to either duplicate it or do it better. So let's talk about the, the people that are, are the platforms that are seeking to uh, disrupt or supplant Twitter. So I'm going to talk about <coughs> the contenders to the throne, if you will. Uh, some Twitter alternatives that people suggest that really don't have a chance to stand a chance simply because while well, they've been around for a while they just don't have the gravitas or the user base to scale it just it's just not happening uh one is gab uh gab is a uh social network that has a 300 character limit so it's almost double that of what twitter is a little bit more and it's a, a big of it as Vot, V-O-A-T, or 4chan on Twitter. It doesn't ban people for quote-unquote offensive speeches. It doesn't block people. You're just allowed to say whatever crap you want on the platform. And you can go back and forth. And there's no banning on the part of Gab from the company from on the users now. Or shadow banning, if you will. Now, users can 
block or ban people and control that. But there's no removing of people off the platform because they've said something froggy or awful to another person. That's just not going to happen. But its user base is not that that large. Uh, while people frequently use it, it's it doesn't have it's not capable. Just the the nature of it. The, the same reason why Twitter has a problem, Gab has that problem, and people are just not going to go into that to that place to get abused, if you will. Uh, what's another place? Uh, you have Mastodon. Well, not, uh, well, I'll say Mastodon. Mastodon is actually a great platform. Uh, let's see. You have other ones that people talk about, but they're just, they're not quite Twitter-like. There's Twister, Ganuna Social, and Join Dysphoria. They're like these open source, uh, places that you can utilize that are microblogging. They're supposed to function like Twitter-like, but they're just, their UI is not as sophisticated. There's not as many people on the platform. They're open source. You kind of have to tweak and build and know a bit about coding yourself. It's not really done or run by a company because it's open source and it's decentralized, uh, these different platforms. So you're using a totally different network structure than that of a centralized corporate entity like Twitter. Um, so these places, while people cite them as a, an offshoot or a different place to uh, have a Twitter-like interactions with, but without the data mining, without the abuse, uh, except for Gab, uh, the problems that Twitter has is just, you just don't have the people going on there because, you know, it's not an app. You can't, your friends are not going to go on it. That's just the case. And so these type of places are not going to uh, disrupt or unseat Twitter anytime soon. Now, the ones I do think will are is WeChat, Mastodon, are the two, I think, biggest contenders to do that. Now, we talked about Mastodon, Hiroja's, uh, thy, uh, Hiroja's Thought Bubble, where I reviewed Mastodon. And currently, right now, just looking at, um, at, at this instance, um, and we'll break down, how, again, how uh, Mastodon works. But right now they have, for something that's been around since September of 2016, they have a little bit over uh, half a million users. So 699,997. So they're almost up to a million users on this type of platform. And so what Mastodon does, it's a, um, written, going from the Wicca, is a federated social network with similar features to Twitter, but administrates as a decentralized federation of servers running open source software. So basically, anyone can um, set up what's called instance on a server, uh, create their own Mastodon, if you will. So uh, the example I gave was like Mastodon Houston Rockets. So you can talk about the, the basketball team, Houston Rockets. And you have a 300 character limit. Uh, this this uh, open software is uh, so it's open source. So you can customize this software to your liking. And you can allow other different instances, like maybe just exclusively instances that are about the NBA uh, basketball teams onto your onto your um, social network. Or you can just keep people blocked off and you just can be just about Houston Rockets. And you can have uh, as many users as you want. You can cap the users. Uh, a lot of it is controlled basically by the administrate, the admin, if you will. Uh, and so there's a bit of a third trusted party issue there where you have to trust that the admin is not going to sell off your data or abuse it or something like that. But it is, the whole purpose is, is built on for privacy of the users. You can control who can see your see what are called toots, uh, with the, how your followers can follow you, uh, if you get your uh, particular, what instance you want to join, to see what type of other instances they're a part of. Uh, so it's very user-focused and tries to pin, uh, prevent abusers. And it's upfront about the fact that if you abuse the system, if you have these bots, or if you're malicious, you're going to get kicked off of all these different instances and be banned. Um, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. So kind of read a little bit more from the wiki here. You know, users belong to a single Mastodon server known as an instance where they post short messages for others to read. Subject to privacy settings of the user and instance, the service seeks to distinguish itself from, from Twitter through its orientation towards small communities and community base rather than top-down moderation. Like Twitter, Mastodon supports direct private messaging between users, but unlike tweets posted on Twitter, Mastodon's tweets can be private to the user, private to the user's followers, public, or specific instances. 
or public across a network of instances. A network of federated Mastodon instances uh, forms one part of the Fediverse or federated network that includes servers running any social network software that uses O status. Uh, the Mastodon mascot is sitting on a probe sign using a tablet or a smartphone. However, the distributor of the fur is more suggestive of a woolly mammoth than a Mastodon. And it's uh, the social structure is very similar to uh, a third-party app program known as TweetDeck that allows you to utilize Twitter uh, in a more effective manner than uh, what Twitter itself has put out. Now, while this is uh, addresses a lot of the social community issues that people have had with Twitter, with the abuse of things of that nature, and they do have these federated services, I, I don't know if it can get to that global reach. It has increased a lot of people have come to it. There's a lot of strong activity through all these different instances. Um, you have like these really strong community and very niche knit stuff. But to get that global broadcast, the, there would have to be a stronger or bigger uh, usage basis, if you will, for the instances to kind of travel out of the network, if you will. And while there's these federated universes where you can have people joining and hearing and seeing and different stuff. Um, well, I think it's quite a contender to disrupt Twitter and, and pull away from that. And when I mean pull away from it, pull away from the social aspect, pull away from the, the social information aspect where you, this is a place where you could check to get your information. I'm not quite certain. And I think it would probably be like a year, probably the end of this year to see whether or not this can fully disrupt Twitter. If it could fully knock Twitter back a peg, if you will. Now, the one I do think that is a serious contender, and if it ever really kind of gains traction, even though you can get the, what is known as a WeChat, which is a Chinese uh, app program or micro-messaging program, is ever too able to kind of break out of that. And there's a look, there are some hang-ups with the WeChat, why it might not. But if it ever were to break out, if you will, this could really seriously... Uh, globally disrupt Twitter. So this is what the WeChat is. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. Uh, it's something that's bannered around and a lot of uh, different social media sites have taken certain aspects of the WeChat and then incorporated it into their platform. So the WeChat, literally means micro message, is a Chinese social media instant messaging and commerce and payment service application developed by uh, Tencent. It was released in 2011 and by 2020, 2017 is one of the largest standalone message apps by monthly active users with over 938 million active users. However, as of 2016, WeChat has not been successful in penetrating international markets outside of China. And one of the reasons why that is, is just the nature of how um, <coughs> China handles its internet infrastructure. You know, you have the big firewall of China. Uh, it requires a lot of the different... Uh, social programs and they're being very persistent on it at least starting this year on the crackdown of having real identities associated with your accounts uh, linking your bank accounts and your stuff to your social media platforms is very censorship heavy so there's that issue so there's not really much dissent or talk of dissent even when they try to change their verbiage or, or usage to either celebrate something or advocate something uh, accounts get shut down people get arrested um, and it's because of that that people are very hesitant to use WeChat for that for that reason is because you cannot it doesn't have the freedom of speech. It's just not part of the, the governmental um, infrastructure of China. You just don't have free speech. So because the company has to be compliant to that and go out, out into these international waters, if you will, there's a very hesitant. Uh, case, if you will, for people to use something that they know they can't say whatever it is they want to say on that platform. Now, there's many aspects of WeChat that people have taken, like particularly the incorporation of, of banking information into uh, the platform, getting their users to pay for different stuff, all these, these micro payments, if you will, uh, games, uh, filters, things of that nature. WeChat has been very successful, and in China in general, very successful in getting their users to pay for stuff online versus um, the rest of the world where that's not been such the case. So these are the different features of the WeChat. So messaging. WeChat provides text messaging, hold-to-talk voice broadcasting, one-to-many messages, video conference, video games, sharing photos and videos and location sharing. 
You can exchange contacts with people via Bluetooth as well as providing various features for contacting people at random if desired. It's also integrated with other social networks such as, such as uh, Facebook and Tenants QQ. Uh, photographs may also embellish with filters, captions, and automatic, and automatic translation services. Uh, WeChat sorts different ways of instant messages, including text message, voice messages, walkie-talkie, and stickers. Uh, users can send previously saved or live pictures and videos, name cards, and other user coupons, lucky money packages, uh, which is our like, uh, donations or tipping, if you will, and your current GS GPS location with friends either individually or in a group chat. Uh, we chat's character signatures such as to seek rebels resemble and compete with those of line and Japanese messaging application. So official accounts. Uh, we chat supports users who wish to register as an official account, which is able them to push fees to subscribers, interact with subscribers, and provide them with services. There are three types of official account services, account, subscription account, and enterprise account. Once users or individuals or organizers set up a type of account, they cannot change it into another type. By the end of 2014, the number of WeChat official accounts had reached uh, 8 million. Official accounts of organizations can apply for verified as a cost of 300 RDMB. Uh, official public accounts. Official accounts can be used as a platform for services such as hospital pre-registration, visa renewal, or credit card services. So this is how they got you know people to pay. If you want to get the blue check on Twitter, you uh, just talk to Twitter and go through a process and you get the check, but you don't have to pay. On uh, WeChat, you do. Uh, they have moments on their platform, uh, similar to Snapchat and Facebook and Twitter accounts. Uh, but one of the things that they do do is privacy is extremely important in WeChat. Only your friends from the user's contacts are able to view their moments, contents, and comments. The friends of the users will be able to see their likes and comments from other users only if they are mutual friends in the group. So, for example, friends from high school are not able to see comments and likes from friends from university. And when users post their moments, they can separate their friends into a few groups and they can decide whether this moment can be seen by a particular group of people. Uh, contents posted can be set to private and can be unset at any time. When a post is set to private, only the user can view it. So they do have that act aspect of it for you have a much stronger control of who can see what on your timeline. Um, you know, Twitter does that when uh, people go private, but they don't do that for like the whole public setting. But again, uh, there is still censorship involved because even with these private groups or something like that, they're still monitored. And if you, if your group is the wrong kind of group, uh, you can get in trouble or censored in some sense. So here we go. This is where this the hesitation to join WeChat, WeChat and why there might need to be maybe two versions of WeChat. I'm not sure what WeChat can do to... Uh, break away from this type of activity, but here we go. Censorship, global censorship. Starting in 2013, reports rose that the Chinese language searches even outside China were being keyword filtered and then blocked. This can hurt both on incoming traffic to China from foreign countries, but also exclusively between foreign parties. The service had already censored its communication with China. In the international example of blocking, the message was displayed on user screens. This message, your message contained restricted words, please check it again. These are simplified Chinese characteristics of the Gansu based paper called Southern Weekly or Artenum Southern Weekend. The next day, Tenet released a statement addressing the issue, saying a small number of WeChat international users are not able to send certain messages due to a technical glitch this Thursday. Immediate action has been taken to rectify it, and we apologize for any conveniences caused to our users. We will continue to improve the product features and technical support to provide better use experience. WeChat plan to build two different platforms to avoid this problem in the future. One for Chinese mainlanders and one for the rest of the world. The problem exists because WeChat servers are all located in China and thus subject to censorship rules. So here we go. The two censorship system. In 2016, a Citizen Lab published a report saying that WeChat is using different censorship, censorship policies in mainland China and other areas. They found that one, key fi keyword filtering is only enabled for users registered via phone numbers from mainland China. Two, users won't get notices anymore when messages are blocked, and three, filtering is more strict on group chat. Keywords are not static, and some newfound censorship words are in response to current news events. Uh, five, international browser, browsers and WeChat will block China accounts from accessing some websites such as gambling. Uh, the following gong and critical reports on China. International users are now blocked except a expect accessing some gambling and pornography websites. And there's some other restrictions. Uh, in 2014, 
WeChat announced the according to related regu- regulation domains of web pages that want to get shared in WeChat MOAs need to get an in- internet content provider ICP license by t- December 31st, 2014 to avoid being restricted by WeChat. So it's because of these type of restrictions is why at this point in time, uh, WeChat hasn't supplanted uh or disrupted Twitter. Uh, it has influenced it with the whole of moments, the stickers, and the different features that WeChat has. It has influenced, like, you have Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and other uh, social media platforms, and just platforms in general looking at WeChat and seeing how they're able to get their customers to pay for things, uh, their business account, and how they operate internally with the micropayments and the linking of different financial accounts. But until they fix the solution, until they either stop censorship or have successfully split uh, WeChat for being two different areas, it's not going to happen. But it has the strongest, I think, of anyone really to supplant Twitter. Because already they have 930, almost a billion people on their platform. So if anyone could do this, even if there is a split, it would be this particular uh, service. And, the, you know, this is where a lot of uh, Chinese people, even with the censorship, censorship, and even Asia in general, get their information, get their news, uh, have their discussions, the same activities and, and thoughts that go with uh, Twitter and other social media apps. Uh, WeChat is Twitter. WeChat is a place to go that where all that information happens. And then finally, a potential, but again, I'm not sure if it is possible, is this platform called uh, ETH Tweet, uh, ETH Tweet, which is an Ethereum platform based off the smart smart contract platform, uh, Ethereum, the cryptocurrency, uh, that allows you to create smart contracts and build off and, and create a various forms of apps and dApps and, and whatever it is you're seeking to do uh, using the, the Ethereum cryptocurrency or token, if you will, uh, that seeks to disrupt uh, Twitter or and it basically points out, states that they want to disrupt Twitter uh, by using the Ethereum platform. So I'm just going to read a little bit about it, what it says. Uh, decentralized Twitter. So the response state contains a code of decentralized microblock service running on Ethereum blockchain. The service provides, provides basic Twitter-like functionality to tweet messages up to 160 characters. Here, decentralization means that there's no company or central authority and control is being published. The system, system is censorship resistant and says that once a message is published, it can only be removed by the publisher. All accounts receive donations in Ethereum, ETH cryptocurrency. Being able to receive donations could be an incentive to run a decentralized micro boggy feed. To not expose the user's social graph to the world, following other accounts is not supported on purpose. If you want to edit the source file, you can use Ethereum. Okay, so basically what it is, this is like a micro uh, platform to where uh, you can publish whatever it is you're seeking to publish. Uh, you, you're not going to get censored, uh, which is one of the things that people uh, kind of gripe about with Twitter is that people get banned for some of the things that they've said shadow banned, um, whether it be for good things, bad things, or whatever, uh, that your information is not controlled. Uh, we talked about it a little bit at the top of the adder about the uh, embedded tweets where you're not um, getting paid when somebody takes your embedded tweets and puts it into a, uh, a newspaper article, if you will. Uh, all the data mining that occurs on Twitter and pretty much all social media apps because they're owned by a company and they're and not to mention the hackability of it being centralized. So if you utilize uh, your phone number, uh, if you're using your real name, uh, some email addresses, all that information, if it got out there, it can be linked to you and disrupt other um, outlets, particularly your phone number, if you will, if you're, it's a phone number that you utilize uh, for other types of services. So this is one way to combat that. Um, in general, I, I don't think... Well, I would hope for one day for there to be a decentralized Twitter platform um, that's not controlled by a central authority and allows for flexibility for anyone and everyone to uh, participate and have some say and control in. Um, I just don't think at this point in time there's really 
not a really good contender to, to, to disrupt Twitter, to knock it off this notch. As much as the problems and failings that Twitter has, it it works. It really does. It does broadcast that message globally around the world for everyone and anyone to hear. But I just don't think that there is a platform that is going to supplant that. Or one that anyone has really envisioned to be able to do that. Uh, granted that Twitter does have this weird identity crisis where it's like a has these uh, video platforms and having uh, original content going on with television programs, uh, licensing television programs, NFL games, things of that nature. Uh, at one point it had Vine and then it shut down Vine. It has Periscope, so that has helped with this whole uh, disruption of news, which is one of the reasons why like the video aspect where you see um, protests, uh, natural disasters, news events, uh, things of that nature gets reported. Uh, people's thoughts and daily blogs, comedic jokes, memes, gifs, all of that is happening on the Twitter. Uh, it's just one of the better platforms for doing that. It's one of the biggest town criers, if you will, out there. And while I do think that WeChat and Mastodon have a chance or an opportunity to disrupt or knock Twitter down a bit and maybe change the nature of how the town crier works, I just am not certain that that is going to happen. So that's pretty much it for this uh, this portion of the episode. I just have one more thing, which is um, the manifesto, and then we'll wrap things up. A Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace by Jer- John Perry Barlow. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace and the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask for the past to leave us alone. You're not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we, where we gather. We have not elected government, nor are we likely to have one. So I address you with no greater authority than with, than that with than that with which liberty itself always speaks. I declare the global social space we are building to, na- to be naturally independent of the, ter- the tyrannies you seek to impose on us. You have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any method of enforcement. We have true reason to fear. Governments deprive their p- just powers from the consent of the governed. You have neither solicited nor received ours. We do not invite you. You do not know us, nor do you know our world. Cyberspace does not lie within our your borders. Do not think that you can build it as though it was a public construct, construction project. You cannot. It is an act of nature and it grows itself throughout our collective actions. You have not engaged in our great and gathering conversations, nor do you create the wealth of our marketplace. You do not know our culture, our ethics, or our written codes that have already provided our society more order than could be attained by any of your impositions. You claim there are problems among us that you need to solve. You use this claim as an excuse to evade our precincts. Many of these problems don't exist. Where there are real conflicts, where there are wrongs, we will identify them and address them by our means. We are forming our own social contract. This government will arise according to the con- to the conditions of our world, not yours. Our world is different. Cyberspace consists of transactions, relationships, and thought itself arrayed like a stand- standing wave in the web of communication. Ours is a world that is both everywhere and nowhere, but is not where bodies live. We have created a world that only that all may enter without privilege or prejudice according according by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. We are creating a world where anyone anywhere may express his or her her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and contents do not apply to us. They are all based on matter, and there's no matter here. Our identities have no body, so unlike you, we cannot obtain order by physical corrosion. We believe that from ethics, enlightened self-interest, and the common wealth, our governance will emerge. Our identities may be distributed across many of your jurisdictions. The only law that all our constituent cultures would generally recognize is the Golden Rule. We hope we will be able to build our particular solutions on that basis. If we cannot accept solutions, you are attempting to impose. In the United States, you have today created a law, the Telecommunication Reform Act, which repudiates your own constitution and insults the dreams of Jefferson, Washington, Mill, Madison, uh, Tocqueville, and Baradis. 
Brandis. These dreams must now be born anew in us. You are terrified of your of your own children, since they are natives in a world where you will always be immigrants. Because you fear them, you trust your bureaucracy with the parental responsibilities you are too cowardly to confront yourself. In our world, all the sentiments and expressions of humanity, from the debasing to the angelic, are part of a seamless whole, the global conversation of bits. We cannot separate the air that chokes from the air upon which wings beat. In China, Germany, France, Russia, Singapore, Italy, and the United States, you're trying to ward off the virus of liberty by erecting guard posts at the, at the frontiers of cyberspace. These may keep out the contingent for a small time, but they will not work in a world that will soon be blanketed in the bit varying medium. Your increase, increasingly obsolete information industries will perpetrate themselves by proposing laws in America and elsewhere that claim to own speech itself throughout the world. These laws will declare ideas to be another industrial product, no more noble than pig iron. In our world, whatever the human mind may create can be reproduced and distributed to infinity at no cost. The, the global conveyance of, of thought no longer requires your factories to accomplish. The increasing hostile and colonial measures placed in the same position as those previous lovers of freedom and self-determination who had rejected the authorities of distant, uninformed powers. We must declare our virtual selves immune to your sovereignty even as we continue to consent to your rule over our bodies. We will spread ourselves across the planet so that no one can arrest our thoughts. We will create civilized civilizations with a mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the, than the world your governments may have, have made before. Uh, and it was written in Davos, Switzerland, February 8th, 1996. And so that's it uh, for this episode. I know it was a bit of a doozy, but I think it's very important considering how important the nature of Twitter is, but given considering how now with a lot of a series of events where and the encry encryption is going to be banned or outlawed potentially, or there's efforts to do that. The erosion of net neutrality, or actually to do it away with it on the on the U.S. government, the, the this is clamping down of different uh, forms of communication on the internet in general for all sorts of weird ideological reasons. And I think just addressing Twitter in itself is importance and the fact that some seek to disrupt it uh, to be better than Twitter, if you will, to be something different, a little bit different than Twitter, but to be that town crier, if you will. And Twitter is important. Uh, Twitter is a platform that is important. Um, maybe it can improve itself, address its uh, abuse issues, maybe address some of the, the data mining and privacy issues that it has, or maybe it will eventually uh, get disrupted by either WeChat which is no better than Twitter in the sense of privacy and censorship issues, or something like a Mastodon or an Ether tweet, if you will, uh, blockchain technology, or something wholly new that someone else has come up with. But um, again, just think it was something to discuss and talk about. So I am uh, logging off for now, and I will see you out on the streets. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.